Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you. We had some calls from the last program that were lit up, but then they hung up. But if you uh, go ahead and call back in, you know the number. Uh, we'll, we may just take your calls and do an open line Thursday of sorts. Uh, if you're of a mind you want to finish your conversation, we, can, we have more than three verses uh, to talk about. But anyway, I'm glad you're with us tonight, and here's our contact information. If you would like to reach me uh, any other time, 276-340-2653, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. We meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, and if you would like to study the Bible with us, we'd be glad for you to come and assemble with us. H23 Starting Avenue in Martinsville, 120 American Legion in Danville. Uh, on uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Sundays. Uh, you can study the Bible with us anytime, or we'll be glad to come out and study the Bible with you, or meet you at any time to study God's Word with you. We're so glad that you are, are interested in, in God's Word. I do want to say, uh, so grateful to uh, the, uh, the young lady that obeyed the gospel. <clears throat> uh, when was it now? It was Monday. Yeah. So uh, there in Eden, she came to the tent nearly every night, and uh, we had Bible studies with her. After that, and she obeyed the gospel. She uh, is now a member of the Lord's Church. And if you would like to find about find out about that church, the church you read about in the New Testament, we'd be glad to study with you. As a matter of fact, tonight our lesson is about that very thing: trying to find the church that you read about in the New Testament. Now, you know the Bible uh, talks about a church, but you really don't know which one it is until you know what to look for. Now, Isaiah said in Isaiah 35 and verse 8, uh, And highway shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring man, though fools, shall not err therein. So, you don't just stumble upon the church that you read about in the Bible. It's a way of holiness. But it's not a way that you can just happen upon. I heard... Uh, Caleb was talking about you don't just you don't just read the Bible and go well I'm in this church and you wind up in another man-made church. That's not that's not finding the true church. This is the church that you really have to search for. It is the way. Now when Isaiah prophesied about the way of holiness, we are going to find out what that way is when we get to the New Testament. Notice this in Acts eight and verse three. The Bible says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. And you say, well, James, how do you know that's the way? How do you know that that is the way that Isaiah was talking about? Because notice this, in Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus, who made havoc of the church and committed men and women to prison <coughs> who were members of the church, said this. It says uh, that he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Well, the way is the church. So the church that Saul of Tarsus made havoc of is the way that he also persecuted. Now, how do you know if you found that way? How do you know if you found that church? Now, you, you can look in the yellow pages, you see a whole lot of churches that are listed in the yellow pages. You can turn on the TV and you can have a whole lot of, find a whole lot of churches that, are, that are, uh, uh, have broadcast on, on television. But how do you know which one is right? How do you know which one is actually the way that you find in, in, the, uh, in the Bible? Well, here's how you find. Here's how you find it. You have to know what you're looking for. All right? You have to know what you're looking for. You have to be able to identify it. And there's a way that you can do that. It's if you know. See? Let me ask you this. Here's, <clears throat> here's a, uh, an example, illustration of how, uh, how you can find the true church. Now, if I ask you, how do you know who is playing football? Now, Fred will know. Fred knows who's playing football. But if you're not familiar with sports... You may not know which is football, or you may not know if, if there's even a picture of a football player up there or not. So how do you know who's playing football? Well, the answer is you find out the rules. 
if you know something about the rules of the game, you can determine who's playing football or who's playing baseball or who's playing basketball because the rules help you define or determine the parameters of the game. In other words, if, you, if I said, who's, who, which one is playing football? You said, well, I don't know. Describe the game of football. Let's find out some rules of football. Well, football is played on a field that it is 100 yards long and I, I'm going to forget this now. I think it's about 40 yards wide. It's 100 yards long. Uh, the ball is oblong, right? The players wear helmets with face masks, all right? They can throw the ball, catch the ball, run with the ball. So this is football, but this is baseball. You hit a little round ball with a, with a big stick, and you run around a diamond-shaped uh, field. Now, you see, when you start knowing just even some basic rules of the game, you can easily determine what sport is what, but only until you know the rules of the game. But once you know those rules, you have some identifying marks that you can go by. Well, friends, here's what you can go by. Here's, here's one of the rules or one of the principles that you can find to find the church of Christ. You have to find the church that's actually using the New Testament. And so the one that's following the New Testament is the church that you're going to find. Now, the sad thing about it is there's a lot of churches of men that do not follow the rules of the New Testament. They don't follow the rules of the New Testament. And the result is when you go looking for a church that's following the rules, they've got everything so jumbled up you don't know who's who and what's what. You don't know what's on first and who's on second. And so it makes it very hard to even find out what they're doing. You know, now if I said, what sport is this guy playing? Well, man, he's got everything going on. He's got a soccer ball right here. He's got an ice skate on one, on one foot. He's got a, a basketball there by the other foot. He's got a scuba flipper on one, uh, one foot. He's got a tennis racket in one hand, a baseball glove in one hand. He's catching a baseball. He's got a football helmet and a baseball cap on his head. He's got a football under one arm. He's got a bag of golf clubs over his shoulder that has a hockey stick in it and a lacrosse stick in it and uh, even uh, I guess that's a, a field hockey stick in it. So I have no idea what game this guy's playing. And when you go to some of these, New Test uh, some of these uh, churches looking for the New Testament church, You'll, you'll say, what in the world is going on? I have no idea what they're playing, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're playing. They are not the true church. Why? Because it's easy to see that they're not following the rules. They're not following the rules. So you might not know what they are, but you can know what they're not. Even if you just know a few rules. See how easy it is, friends? And so when we're talking about the church you read about the New Testament, we're talking about the church of Christ. Now, one of the rules, one of the principles, or one of the rules that we're going to be looking at has to do with structure or organization. You know, what are some of the rules that the New Testament church follows? What are some of the rules that it, that it adheres to, it follows, in order to be identified as the true church? Well, the New Testament structure or organization is one of them. In other words, you can find out if the church you're looking at is the true church by seeing how it's structured. Now, when we say structure, when I say structure, I'm talking about something that gives it order. Organization. I hear people talk, say all the time, well, I don't like organized religion. Well, the only alternative is unorganized religion, and I've definitely seen that. You go to any Pentecostal church around, and you'll see unorganized religion. I mean, it is chaos. All right, people jumping, hollering, hooping, and shouting, and rolling on the floor. That's, that's crazy. That's chaos. That's unorganized. That looks like that guy. That, the, that looks like this, this right here. That's what that looks like. But if you're looking for the Lord's church, it is the church that has some order to it. Now, here is one of the key elements of the structure of the Lord's church, okay? Here's one of the key elements. Let me talk about the key element by showing you some man-made churches. Now, what 
do all of these cities have in common? Springfield, Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, Silver Spring, Maryland, Cleveland, Tennessee, Salt Lake City, Utah, Memphis, Tennessee. <clears throat> you know what they all have in common? What they all have in common is they're all the headquarters for churches of men. They're all the headquarters for denominations. Now, the uh, Assemblies of, of God are in Springfield, Missouri. The International Church of uh, the Nazarene is in Kansas City, Missouri. Seventh-day Adventist, Silver Spring, Maryland. Cleveland, Tennessee <coughs> is the headquarters for the Church of God. The Salt Lake, Salt Lake City is the headquarters where you find the headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Church of God in Christ is in Memphis, Tennessee. So, what we're talking about is then what is the, or where is the headquarters for the Church of Christ. Now, let me show you what I mean by people who don't know the, what to say, the game. I'm not saying the church is a game, but we'll just use that analogy again. When you don't know what you're looking for, you really don't know what you're describing. Here's a, here's a good example. Here's a caller that calls in, and it's talking about the headquarter, headquarters of the Church of Christ. Listen to what she has to say. I think we'll get it here. Maybe. I'm afraid I just froze it up. Yep. Well, the caller proceeds to say that the headquarters for the church of Christ is in Texas. Let's see if this will play this way. While that's waiting to respond. I may have to Really? Must have been a good point. Well, okay. Matt, all of my computer froze up. Well, yeah, up again, the caller's telling us that she knows where the headquarters for the Church of Christ is. Quarters of the Church of Christ on Earth. Headquarters in Texas, where Johnny's from. There's no headquarters of the Church of Christ in Texas. Okay. Say what you want to. Like I said, it's been years. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you know so much him. about what Don we believe. Was on there. He was associated as an affiliate of the headquarters. He was sent up here and recruited. Ma'am, you don't know anything about what you're talking about. I do. No, you don't. Get, yes, I do. get it on. Bring it out. Bring the information, please. Expose oh, us for being the false teacher. More. And I'll, I'll probably be back next week. But when you record okay. me... Well, I'll tell you what, next week, bring your facts. Recording the whole... Ma'am, bring listen. your facts next week. Bring your facts. Show us the headquarters. Show use. us the headquarters of the Church of Christ in Texas. Show us where it is. Because I can assure you, I'm from Texas. I've never seen the headquarters. Never been there. As a matter of fact, the headquarters for so the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in Texas? Ma'am? Are you telling me that there's no Church of Christ in Texas? Now, that's not what I said. There are a lot of churches of Christ in Texas, congregations of the Church of Christ, but there is no headquarters. All right, now, she seemed to know a whole lot about the Church of Christ. She thought, she said she'd call back next week. We're still waiting on her to call back. You know, that's been 
Four years, I believe. So here, here it is. The, the Church of Christ is headquartered in Texas, somewhere in Texas, because there's an affiliate with the headquarters or something that sent somebody up to do something. Friends, if she would just open the Bible, she could easily see that the headquarters for the Church of Christ is not in Texas. Now, the Church of Christ does have a headquarters because it has a head. Now notice this. In the New Testament, the church has a head. The head is the, the place where you get your marching orders. In Colossians 1 and verse 18, the Bible says, and he is the head of the body, the church. So he's the head of the body, he's the head of the church. And the head is where the body gets its marching orders, has all authority. In Colossians 2 and verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, For in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So the head of the church, the head, the fullness of, 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 of the Godhead bodily is Christ. Christ is the head of the church. He has all authority and all power. As a matter of fact, in Matthew uh, 28... Matthew 28 and verse, let's get a Bible up here. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Jesus came unto them and saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He has all authority, especially over the church. He's the head of the church. So the head of the church is Christ. Now, later on we're going to figure out where he's, where he's quartered where the headquarters of the church is, but you can see that the church does have a head, and therefore it's going to have a headquarters. Now, what we need to do is let's do a little more have a little more understanding about the head. The head of the church, the head of the church is Christ, and there is only one. There's only one. One head and one body. One head and one church. One church, one body. One church, one head. One head, one church. One church, one head. One body. They're all the same. One head and one body. Ephesians 4 and verse 4. And so Christ has the ultimate authority of what happens in the church. Now friends, when someone says, well, we're all New Testament churches. Or we're all part of the church of Christ. No, because they all have different headquarters. A church that has an earthly headquarters cannot be, in no way, shape, or form, be the church you read about in the New Testament. It just can't happen. It just can't happen. Now, what does it look like? So what does the church look like? Well, the church, the head of the church is the one that gives the rules. In James 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? One lawgiver. The lawgiver is Christ. He's the one that gave all the rules for the church. Notice what he tells Peter in Matthew. I believe it's Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. He says, I give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, it was already bound in heaven. The rules had already been made. The apostles were only delegating the rules. And so... Christ is the ultimate lawgiver. That's why when you hear in the New Testament, when you hear Paul speaking, he talks about doing things in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Christ has the authority. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because he has all authority. He's the lawgiver. He's the one who makes the rules. He's the one who makes the rules. Now, friends, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. If Christ makes the laws, 
if Christ makes the rules, then it stands to reason that any departure from the rules ceases to be the Lord's church and thus ceases to follow Christ. So you can tell which church is following the rules. Christ is the king. He's the one who's making the rules. And therefore, he's the one who has uh, all power. Notice what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 2. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 2. Verses 2 through 5. He says, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of, out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever he pleaseth him. Where the word of the, Lord, of the king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Where the king's word is, there's power. Well, Christ is the power. He's the authority. His rule is the one that rules. Now, friends, when you're talking about man-made churches, when you start looking at them, they have all kinds of rules. They have all kinds of rules that make them different. Now, now you can go down here to Burger King. The Burger King says you can have it your way. Have it any way you want to at Burger King. But when it comes to the church, we have to listen to the king of kings. Because the king always gets what he wants. Now friends, I don't know why that's such a hard thing for people to understand. The Bible is the rules for the New Testament church. The New Testament has the rules for what goes on in the New Testament, in the New Testament church. Now, why is it that people come along and say, well, I'm going to change the rules? Who gives that authority? Who made you so special that you can change what God says he wants? And really when you think about it, friends, I want you to consider that the Lord's church is very, very appealing. It's very attractive because Christ is the only one who makes the rules. He's the head. And therefore, he makes the rules. One head giving one set of rules, and therefore no one can come along and say, well, I'm going to do it my way. Because, you know, that's really where the church of men depart from the Bible. It all starts with, I want to do it my way. Now, friends, if it were up to me and you, we could all do things the way we want to, and we can do it... Uh, our way, because our way's best. Everybody knows that our way, my way's best, right? If you say, well, whose way's best? Everybody's going to say me, my way. Well, you know, Frank Sinatra may have a church and do it his way. Elvis may have a church and do it his way. But you know what? Christ has a church, and it's going to be done his way. Now, that should make it very, very appealing because that way no one can say, well, you're being unfair. You know, if I made the rules, more than likely I'm going to be favorable to me, at least in something. That's the tendency that everybody has. If they make, if they make the rules, the rules always favor the rule makers. But if Christ is the rule maker, Christ is the king that's making the rules, guess what? You and I are not going to be slighted. We are all going to be certain to have equality based upon the rules. So if I'm looking for the New Testament church, I'm going to look for the one that has Christ as its head. I'm going to look for the one that has Christ as the one making the rules. That way, his rules can be best. Now, here's why this is so special. Because the, the Lord's church has a system of government, if you will. It has a government. Now, that government is not like man's government in the sense of it shows partiality and favoritism. But when you think about the form of government that's best, if you had to make a form of government, friends, you would want to pattern after the New Testament church. That would be the best form of government. Consider, here are some forms of government that are, exist in the world today. 
democracy. Democracy. Now, a lot of people think we live in a democracy. Friends, we do not live in a democracy, and I'm glad for it. Because a democracy, democracy says the majority rule. The majority rule. But friends, truth cannot be determined by majority rule because the majority of people may believe or may want something that is immoral and ungodly. And that's what you see more and more in our country. You see a majority of people wanting certain things and then laws get passed. But it's not because of a democratic vote. I mean, it's a democratic process, but we do not live in a pure democracy. Now, if I ask someone, well, let's define truth, then if the majority wanted something, they said, well, this is true. Now, that's where we have all kinds of trouble. Everybody says, well, let's, let's make this the truth. You know, let's make, let's make one man and one woman the truth about marriage. Well, as time goes on and more and more people become immoral and ungodly, they start making, well, let's make two men a marriage. And they think that just because, well, we've got it passed, which it really didn't pass, really the courts forced it upon the majority, if you really want to get right down to it. The court system forced the will of a few on the majority. That is certainly not a democracy. Now, I would not want to live in a democracy. And I surely wouldn't want the church to be a democracy. What about an oligarchy? Would you want to live in an oligarchy? An oligarchy says the minority makes the rules. That is, a few get their way. Now, in a way, friends, we live in an oligarchy more than we live in a democracy, even. Because just like we were talking about, a few individuals have forced their will upon a majority. You don't believe that's right? You don't believe it's right? Just look at some of the laws we have. I know in North Carolina, when it came to a vote on, uh, uh, on the marriage amendment, 76% of people were opposed to same-sex marriages. But yet, look what we have. Look what we have. We have fights all the time about magistrates not wanting to give the uh, marriage license to people because it's against their morals and their convictions. Why? Because the courts forced it on us. Well, see, a democracy is not, not healthy. Pure democracy is not healthy, and neither is an oligarchy, where just a few get their way because, man, would you want your will to be imposed upon by just a few? But isn't that what we have? Sometimes we call it Congress, sometimes we call it the president. Sometimes we call it the, the Supreme Court. That, in a sense, that's, that's an oligarchy, a few. I mean, you talk about the, 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 the United States government. You have one president, 436 members of the House, the 435, 435, 436, 100 members of the Senate. So 535 people, 536, you got nine Supreme Court justices. 536 plus 9, whatever it is, 545, and they're forcing the will. They're making the rules. That's an oligarchy. Or what about a plutocracy? A plutocracy is where you're ruled by the rich. Now, in a way, we've got a little bit of that going on, too. And everybody doesn't like that, you know. All the rich don't pay their fair share. The rich, the rich, the rich, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and we all have class envy because we don't like rich people because they have all the money and we don't have any, so what we want to do is we want to take all their money and we'll all be poor, right? We want the government to take everybody else's money so that we all have none. Is that really what you want? Plutocracy? Rule by the rich? I don't think so. I don't want that to be the, the standard of, of authority. But those are forms of government. Now, you can see why these, you would not want these in your secular life, and you certainly wouldn't want them in the church. Well, what about this rule of government? What about... That is ruled by the privileged, right? The rules that have a law for themselves. 
That's what privilege means. It means a law to yourself. You have one law that's above everybody else's. You're privileged. Now, is that really what you want? And they say, well, you might be saying, well, James, in a way we are to live in an aristocracy. Yeah, in a way we do. People have, you know, they're living above the law. Think it doesn't apply to them, right? They think it doesn't apply to them. You know, they can get rid of emails and phones and computers, whatever, and grope and do whatever they want to the women and say whatever they want to say, use locker room language, whatever, and it, it doesn't really matter because, hey, above the law. They're aristocrats. Privileged. You know what? In the Lord's church, that didn't happen. In the Lord's church, the Bible says in Colossians 3 and verse 28 that uh, there is no distinctions like that. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, you see what I'm talking about? The Lord's church is not like man-made governments. Or excuse me, these man-made governments are not like the Lord's church. Because the Lord's church, the Lord's church is a better system of, of, uh, of government. Now what about a monarchy? Well, James, you're talking about a, a theocracy where God is ruled. Well, you can have a theocracy where God is ruled and still have another form of government, which is what I'm going to show you in just a minute. A monarchy is where there's, there's one ruler, the root of one. And in a way, that's what the church is. The church is a monarchy in the sense of God or Christ is the king. Third John. Third John, verses 9 through 11. Listen to what <clears throat> John says. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence, uh, among them receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he, uh, which he doeth, prating against us with uh, malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, but forbiddeth them that do, that would, and casteth them out of the church. Is that really the kind of rule you want to have? Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. Why? He that doeth good is of God, and he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Now, you might say, well, James, you're saying the church is a monarchy. Well, it is because God is the ruler. Well, that is not a good, good thing for the church. Even that in and of itself was, would not be a good thing for the church because men try that. Men try that, and look what you get. This is from the Baptist manual, Hiscox manual. It says, The pastor has the oversight and supervision of all the interests of the church and of all departments of its work, both spiritual and temporal. You really want one man rule? You really want one pastor? You want one king? You want a monarchy? That's what the pastor system is, friends. You folks, you folks that have the, have the pastor system, you got one pastor, the chief pastor, senior pastor. He makes all the rules, right? Yep. And you better not, you better not buck him. You better not, you better not uh, go against his will. You'll be out on your ear. Won't you? See? See how a monarchy, how it can have its downfalls? Now, if the monarchy is truly God, then you're following the Bible. But I want you to see God's wisdom that man actually imitated to have a good form of government. I want you to look at this. The government we live under, friends, now you can say what you want to about, about the country and the government, now, the government itself, the people that are in it, are the corrupt ones. But the system of government is the best form of government that we could have on this earth. 
in a sense of fairness and equality and making sure that one person or group of people don't have all the power. Now, remember I said the system is the best. I didn't say the people in the system are, are the best because they've corrupted the system. But let's look at the system. See, don't say the, don't say the system's broke just because the people running it are broke. But the form of government we live under is a represented republic. It allows people to have some democratic vote or democratic, the democratic process where we elect a representative. And that representative then is in one of these legislative branch, branches. All right? So the citizens elect a person to represent them. Now, why is a represented republic, why is it the best form of government? I didn't say it was, it was the greatest, but it's the best form of government that we could come up with. Why is that? Because of this right here, what you see in these pictures. Over here, you have the Congress made up of the Senate and the House. House of Representatives. Over here, this is the White House where you have the President, the Executive Branch, and this is the Judicial Branch, the Supreme Court. And the reason why this is a good system of government is because these separation of powers give us a little bit of uh, checks and balances. Now again, I said in principle. If one branch takes over too much power, or if one branch lets another take too much power, then it throws everything out of, out of whack, everything out of kilter. If the Supreme Court starts ramming laws upon the people that aren't really law, that have not been legislated properly, then the Supreme Court has too much power. If the president starts making executive orders that bypass the Congress, well, then the executive branch has too much power. If the Congress doesn't do what these two say and they find ways to work around them, then they have too much power. See how it works? It's checks and balances. Now, the reason I say this is a good form of government is because I want you to see where the wisdom came from. You see, in the Lord's church, while it is a monarchy in the sense of God is the one ruler, I want you to see the wisdom in God's plan. I want you to see the wisdom in God's plan. In the church, you have a judicial branch, so to speak. In John 5 and verse 22, John 5 and verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto his Son. All right? So here's the judicial branch. Christ is the judge. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. To receive a thing done in his body, whether it be good or bad. All right? So here's the judicial branch. Christ is the judge. Now, he gives us some authority to judge. John 7, 24. Judge righteous judgment. But all authority, all authority is his. And he's the judge. Alright? The words that he spoke, they're going to judge us in the last day. John 12, verse 48. So he's already given us the words by which he's going to judge. So in that sense, he's the judge. That's the judicial branch of the church. Now, Consider this. You have a legislative branch. We've already read James 4 and verse 12. There's one lawgiver. Christ is the lawgiver. <coughs> He's given us a, a new law. Someone says, well, we're not under law. Someone says, we're not under law. Well, friends, I beg to differ. We are under law. In Galatians chapter 5, I mean, excuse me, Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, Verse 1, if a man be overtaken in the fall, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. 
bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There's a law. There's a law. So that's the legislative branch. We have a New Testament, a new covenant. That's what, that's what we live by. That's what we live by. So there's the legislative branch. And then here is the executive branch. Christ himself is Lord. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Acts 2 verse 36. Peter says on the day of Pentecost, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. There's the executive branch. Now, the reason I say that is because it looks like our form of government. Or maybe I should say our form of government looks like the church. In the sense of you have a judicial branch, a legislative branch, and an executive branch. But remember, when you have men involved in these things, then power, they're, they're power hungry. And they're not fair, and they won't make rules and laws, or they won't judge uh, correctly, or they'll make executive decisions that lean one way or the other. But there is no respect of persons with God, Acts 10, verse 34. So, if you're going to have the church having a judicial branch, a legislative branch, and an executive branch, what do you need? You need a monarchy. Someone who is fair, who can do all three. And at the same time, not be biased toward uh, some special group. So you have Isaiah 33, verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our judge. And the Lord is our lawgiver. And the Lord is our king. You see, if you want to take all the, the, uh, the bias out of government, you have to delegate that government to one person who you know is going to be unbiased. That's Christ. So Christ is the head of the church. He is the legislative part. He's the judicial part. He's the executive part. He's the king. He's the lawgiver. He's the judge. He's the head. He is the head of the church. And so, if you're talking about a form of government that's best, God's wisdom put it in the church. So, I'm looking for, if I'm looking for the New Testament church, I'm looking for a church that has Christ as its head. So if I find one that's got one man rule, a pastor rule, if I find one that's got the chief bishop of the world, if I find one that has the, the senior right reverend pastor, I'm saying, uh, you know what, that's, that doesn't look like the Lord's church. That's not the rule, that's not what the rules say. The rules say that there's only one head of the church. See that? And so in God's wisdom, he set the church up like this. So if you're looking for the church, you need to find the one that has the right rule. So just as the headquarters of a government or some other institution is quartered somewhere, that it resides somewhere, so is the head of the church. All right, we've got just a few minutes here. You're on the word from the Lord. Uh, yes, James. Are, are people today, the, the believers in Christ and Jesus, Christ Jesus, are we still under the old, I mean, the command, the Ten Commandments? No, ma'am. We're under the New Testament. We're under the New Testament. Okay. Okay. Um, I've heard you all minister on TV about that, but I didn't quite get it. But thank you so much. All right. You, you've, you've just lightened my load. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So... <clears throat> We're talking about a headquarters. Well, if Christ is the head, where is he quartered? Where does he live? Well, Christ is in heaven. Let's quickly, let's look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 10. Acts 1 verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, that's Christ, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, 
Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have received him go into heaven. So if Christ is ahead, where is he? He's in heaven. He's in heaven. He's sitting on the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Who being, in the, uh, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You want to work from the Lord? Yeah, I was just wondering why you went through the whole program and the last few seconds there you put up the phone number to call. I forgot I forgot to tell him to put the phone lines up, but you got a minute. What what can we do for you? <laughs> Sounds like you're a little shady to me. I'd like to ask you a question there in your last few minutes since you wanted to put the phone numbers up to All right, well you're wasting you time. Ready. Well you're wasting time. Let's uh, go. Let me ask you something. If God and Jesus Christ is so merciful, why is it that he kills and lets me kill little innocent infants, tortured, murdered, and raped to death, and he don't do anything about it because your words, not man. God rules, period. Okay. Absolute. Okay. Because just because he rules. All right, all right, let me answer. Let, let me answer. Can't answer. You oh. know you can't. Oh, well, if you'll, if you'll hush, I'll answer. It, just because all God right, is. Just because, just because God has absolute rule doesn't mean that he doesn't give people free will to choose to do right and wrong. Now, he's not a dictator where he says you have to do good but rather he gives us the free choice. And so men commit those heinous crimes that you're talking about, not God, but God as ruler and judge is going to judge them one day. So just because he has all power doesn't mean that he he's... He permits that no. to happen. All right. So just because he all, has all... That's ruler, not, you all, you're not listening, sir. Question. All right. You know, it's... I don't mind answering questions. I love answering questions. But if you're going to call in and ask me a question, then let me answer it, okay? Because I'm running out of time. took the last minute to let you ramble on, and, uh, you know, I didn't really get to answer your question. But just because God has all authority, friends, doesn't mean that he doesn't give men the choice or the power to choose to do evil. And in the end, we just read 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, all are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body, whether good or evil. God is not a respecter of persons. Let's look at one more. Colossians 3 and verse 25 right here. 24 and 25. Knowing that the Lord shall receive the reward of the inheritance. The Lord shall receive the reward of inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ, but... He that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respecter of persons. So, God will be just. God will avenge those that do evil uh, in this lifetime. But just because he allows it to, be, to happen now doesn't mean they doesn't have absolute rule. All right, friends, I'm out of time. Christ is the head of the church, and he's in, he's in heaven. So, the church of Christ... <clears throat> has a headquarters, all right, and it is in heaven. And that's where we look for him to return from. Friends, we're out of time, so if we can help you anyway, I want you to free, please feel free to contact me, 276-340-2653, or word from the Lord at gmail.com. Till next time, always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night. Should ask that guy how much he had to drink.